Hey, my name's Andrew, and today I'm gonna to show you how to go from this to this. Back in 2017, I was dealing with a lot of injuries, so I decided to transition to a zero drop shoe. I literally had no idea where to start, so I just went to YouTube and started watching a bunch of tutorials. But I just ended up more confused because there was all these training plans and stretches and workout routines. I remember thinking like, oh my god, there has to be an easier way. So I just bought a pair of Ultra Torrens and started teaching myself how to run four foot. Three years later, I've now been running in three millimeter barefoot shoes with zero injuries, but I made a ton of mistakes and wasted a ton of money along the way. So basically this video is the guide I wish I had back in 2017, because I'm gonna make everything super simple so you can transition from zero drop to zero injuries in three months. Somewhere around 2008, there was this guy named Golden Harper who was experimenting with shaving off the extra cushioning in the backs of running shoes to make them totally flat. He called it zero drop, and eventually the idea got so popular that he went on the phone Ultra, which is now one of the biggest running brands in the world. Around the same time, Christopher McDougall came out with the book Born to Run, which talked about minimalist and barefoot running, so there was this huge movement towards zero drop footwear. I mean, you can see why, right? Because the human foot is flat. So you would think that flat shoes would be a no-brainer. But the plot thickens because in 2012, this woman named Valerie Bezdek sued Vibram for making unproven claims about the health benefits of their five fingers toe shoes. And the zero drop, minimalist, barefoot debate has been raging ever since. So, uh, what do we make of this and how do you know if you should transition to zero drop? After working at a run specialty store for three years and fitting thousands of customers, I started to get a sense for when someone was about to transition to zero drop. They just have these chronic issues, you know, that didn't get better no matter how many brands or how many shoes they tried. Whether it was shin splints or hip pain or stiff back or tight muscles or all of the above, the bottom line was that running just didn't feel fun anymore. If you can relate, then it's probably worth trying a zero drop shoe. Before you dive in, I just wanna make it clear that changing your stride and the shoes you run in will take time and discipline. So please don't go out and try to transition to a four foot strike in a zero drop shoe right before your first marathon. Give yourself at least three months to just chill and get back to the basics. Okay, so let's say you're ready to make the switch. What are the best zero drop shoes to put on your feet? A lot of people use the terms zero drop and minimalist and barefoot interchangeably, but they're actually three different categories of shoes. Zero drop means any shoe that's the same height in the front and the back. Minimalist means a semi-flexible shoe with a minimal amount of cushion. And barefoot means a highly flexible shoe with no cushion at all. It's no perfect shoe for everyone, but what I aim for is something with zero millimeters of drop, wide toe box, lots of flexibility, and as light as possible. <sighs> I've also created a table in Notion with some basic shoe recommendations for a zero drop transition, and I'll take you through it quickly, but I've also included a link down below. Running completely barefoot is a great way to improve your stride, but unfortunately, a lot of us live in urban areas with rusty nails and broken glass, so it's not always practical. Therefore, the shoe I would recommend for almost everyone is the Vivo Barefoot Primus Lite. Basically, it's just a thin piece of ultra flexible, ultra durable rubber, and the idea is to reset you back to that barefoot feeling you had as a kid, but with just enough protection for whatever sharp objects you might step on. Side note, Vivo Barefoot recently changed the Primus Lite from three millimeters to four millimeters, which is kind of a barn, but it's not a huge deal. Moving on, the Vibram Five Fingers V-Trek is a great option if you have wider feet or if you're running trails and a five millimeter sandal like the Wakova Feather is a good choice if you want a completely open toe box. If you like the idea of a lightweight cushion shoe, then the Vanish R and the Vanish XC by Ultra and the Shama Maximus sandal are all racing flat style options with really minimal amounts of padding. Next up are the medium cushion options, the Escalante, the Lone Peak, and the Alpha Adventure sandal. All of these have a good balance between cushion and responsiveness. Finally, we have the Mac Daddies of Zero Drop shoes. The Torin, the Olympus, and the Mono Gordo sandal are all super high cushion and they're gonna give you that full running on a cloud feeling. Just keep in mind that the more cushion you have under your foot, the more unstable that shoe is gonna feel when the cushion starts to break down. So we've covered the different types of zero drop shoes. Now it's time for the juicy part. How do you actually make the transition? 
number one reason people fail to transition to zero drop is because they go out and try to do too much too fast. So I'm gonna break it down into four simple steps, preparation, form, routine, and prevention. If you follow these steps, they will take you from high drop to zero drop, zero injuries in three months. There are two schools of thought when it comes to transitioning to zero drop shoes. Option one is that you keep doing what you're doing, but you buy lower and lower drop shoes until you transition from 12 millimeters all the way down to zero. This is what I did, but I wouldn't recommend it because it can take a long time and a lot of money to work through two, three, four pairs of shoes. Option two is to completely reset your body by going straight to zero drop but keeping your mileage really low in the beginning to protect yourself from injuries. A good test of whether you're ready to start running zero drop is if you can walk around the house all day like you normally would, but without any shoes, sandals, or inserts. To start running zero drop, you don't need any special exercises or stretches or training plans. You just need one drill. I call it the tightrope. There are three levels of the tightrope, rolling, walking, and running. I'm going to show you different angles and slow down the footage so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. No matter what kind of shoes you end up wearing or not wearing, the best way to learn zero drop is by going barefoot so you can see and feel how your foot is interacting with the ground. Some great places to practice are a local football field or a smooth driveway or in the winter time, just your living room floor. Okay, you ready for level one? Let's do it. You're gonna start by walking, but instead of using a heel to toe stride, you're gonna use a forefoot strike. As you bring your foot forward, tilt it outward so that the pad of your pinky toe touches down first. Next, you're gonna smoothly roll your foot inwards, moving forward until all your body weight is centered over your heel. Touch, roll, stop. Next up, you're gonna take your forefoot roll and turn it into a forefoot walk. The trick here is to keep your eyes focused on one point like a tree branch or a window or even the horizon and make sure that point stays level. Rather than accelerating or decelerating, you should be moving at the same speed throughout your stride. Again, it's the feeling of flowing forward rather than bobbing up and down. Just a side note, you don't have to forefoot strike all the time when you're walking around day to day, but it's an easy way to build up calf strength and work on your running form. All right, level three, you're gonna take everything you learned and roll it into a smooth midfoot strike. Let's try it out. First off, you always wanna keep your knees bent when running forefoot. This turns your whole body into a giant spring as opposed to heel striking, which is more like a jackhammer, sending shock straight up your knees all the way to your hips and back. Secondly, you wanna shorten your stride and increase your cadence because the farther your foot is from your body, the more your leg straightens out and the harder it's gonna to be to cushion yourself. Thirdly, as with any running stride, gravity is your enemy. So keep your heels low to the ground and drive your knees forward rather than pushing upwards with your calf muscles. A common mistake people make is not letting their heels touch the ground and this puts a lot of strain on your calves. Ideally, your heels should come gently to rest on the pavement as you lift up your second foot. So those are the basics of running forefoot. Now let's talk about a daily routine you can use to build strength over the next three months as you transition into a beautiful zero drop butterfly. The first rule of zero drop running is take it slow. If you're doing 30 miles a week, you can't just change to a completely different shoe and stride and expect to do the same mileage. You know how long my first barefoot run was? the end of the street and back. Like, two minutes. Also, if you wanna transition to zero drop and become a stronger, faster runner, you don't need any special exercises or stretches or training plans or gym memberships. You just need to get outside and start slow and gradually increase your speed as your body warms up. Your calf muscles are gonna get sore, but you'll know it's time to turn around when your form starts to break down and you fall back to heel striking. Also, don't be afraid to alternate walking and running. Transitioning to zero drop is not a daily race. It's a long-term investment in your health and happiness as a runner. Now, let's talk about how you're gonna stay injury-free. Let's go back inside. Every day I get comments from doctors and physical therapists and runners who are convinced that zero drop and barefoot shoes cause injuries. It's not like you're doing fine one second and then poof, plantar fasciitis. Injuries happen over time when you ignore the signs that your body is giving you. You're gonna have those moments when adrenaline gets going and you wanna keep pushing and pushing even though that voice in the back of your head says, this is not a good idea. 
So being able to slow down and listen to that voice is a skill that is going to make or break your transition and also your long-term health as a runner. Just to give you an example, for more than 15 years, I stretched and did warm-up exercises and stuck with cushioned shoes because that's what I was supposed to do. But I never enjoyed any of those things and when I stopped doing them, I stopped getting injured. So the moral of the story is don't let anyone tell you what's good for your body, and that includes me. You can listen to what people have to say, you can cautiously try out their suggestions, but if you don't like how something feels, Stop forcing yourself to do it! Okay, one more point. I get comments from people who stopped halfway through their transition because they got shin splints or calf strain or a stress fracture, but the problem is that a lot of them are switching back and forth between zero drop and their old shoes, so how are you ever gonna know what worked and what didn't? My advice would be to just chill for three months. Stick to zero drop, work on your form, and when your calf muscles get tired, which they will, get lots of rest, and don't be afraid to take a few days off and let your body recover. Also, don't write off zero drop in general just because a certain pair of shoes didn't work out for you. High cushion, minimalist, and barefoot shoes all give you a completely different experience, even though they all fall under the category of zero drop. It took me six pairs of shoes to figure out that what works best for me is just a three millimeter piece of rubber, but if I had given up, I wouldn't be here making this video. All right, so you've got yourself a simple training plan. What's the timeline? Like what are the major milestones you should be hitting and how long does it take to fully transition? Everybody's gonna take a different amount of time to retrain their bodies for zero drop shoes, but we all start in the same place, which is just practicing a smooth midfoot stride, whether it's a local track or just your living room. After you're comfortable with that, you can start slowly increasing your mileage into a comfortable running two or three miles without your calves tightening up. Once I hit the three month mark, I was really starting to enjoy zero drop running, but it took me almost a year to get my speed and strength back to where they were when I was running in high drop shoes. It might take you more time or less time, but the good news is that a forefoot strike carries a lot more power than a heel strike. And I was able to go from a 435 to a 425 mile the first time I raced in zero drop shoes. It was like, whoa. The thing is you want to be careful with setting absolute goals because when you get fixated on a certain time or skill schedule or distance, you can end up damaging your body. Ultimately, I decided to give up racing because there is nothing I hate more than being injured. And after seeing so many customers burn out in their 40s and 50s, I just wanted to maximize my chances of being able to run for the rest of my life. No matter what kind of running you're doing, whether you're taking easy or pushing yourself to the limit, just be clear on what you're prioritizing and what the long-term side effects of those choices might be. <sighs> So we've got one more thing to cover, which is where's the best place to run zero drop? People say roads are bad for you, and I tend to agree, but not for the reason you might think. When I transitioned to forefoot running, I spent two years running in three millimeter shoes on pavement and concrete. And I still do occasionally because hard surfaces can actually feel soft with a smooth midfoot stride. The bigger problem is that roads are flat. So what happens is that over time, and especially if you're doing higher mileage, your body can get out of alignment and the lack of variation can lead to repetitive stress injuries. You can protect against that by running down the middle of the road whenever it's safe to and switching up your workouts so you're not using the same stride and speed over and over and over. But even then, roads are still tough on your body. Think of it this way. Roads are like Cheerios. They're cheap and convenient, but they don't have a ton of nutrition. Trails are like granola. They give you a balanced diet of twists and turns and hills and soft and hard surfaces and branches to jump over so you're involving your whole body, not just specific muscle groups. If you don't have any trails around you, a good compromise might be a local football field. Finally, we come to the treadmill, or as it is more commonly referred to, the treadmill. The thing about running on a treadmill is that it teaches you bad habits. Your muscles atrophy, and although you might feel like Roger Bannister if the speed turned up to 15, you're gonna be in for a very rude awakening when you return to solid ground. So that's my guide for transitioning to zero drop, minimalist, and barefoot running. I hope you got some good tips along the way, but if you take away nothing else, just remember these three things. Number one, take it slow. Zero drop is not a race, it's a long-term investment. Number two, listen to your 
your body. Don't let adrenaline hijack your decision making. Number three, have fun. If you don't like doing something, stop forcing yourself to do it and go do something that you actually enjoy. If this video was helpful to you, give it a thumbs up or thumbs down if you're part of the evil high drop empire. If you have a question about the four foot transition, zero drop it down below. See what I did there? Remember, take it slow, listen to your body, have fun, run long, and prosper. Peace.